May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Our text for today is the Gospel from Matthew chapter 18. A mother was putting her little boy to bed one night, and he was saying his prayers as she listened in. He went down his list of family members in his mind, asking God to bless each one of them, made sure he included Grandma and Grandpa, got to the end, and his mother was a little puzzled. And she said, I noticed you didn't pray for Danny, your brother. And he says, no, I'm not going to ask God to bless him. He hit me, and it hurt. And she said, don't you know that Jesus says, forgive your enemies? And he said, He's not my enemy, he's my brother. (laughs) Well, today is about brothers and forgiving them and sisters. Because, you see, Jesus ended this particular parable with the words, if you do not forgive your brother as I have forgiven you. Sometimes it's really hard to forgive a brother or sister, someone that close to you, because you expect them to love you. It's not only a surprise, it's a shock when they hurt you. Jesus had just finished sharing a process by which brothers and sisters in the faith might reconcile to each other when there was a disagreement or a hurt or anger between them. In Matthew 18, he says, if this happens, if someone hurts you, then go to them between you and them alone. And you know that process as it goes in the early part of Matthew 18. But that's when he concludes this parable with, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you if you forgive your, if you, unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It's intended for the community of Christians. It's intended for the church to take heed. And boy, do we desperately need it. Because every year, people leave the church. Not because they disagree with the theology. Not because they don't believe in what Christ means to them as their Savior. But because someone hurt them with an unkind word, a deed, something that drove them away from this fellowship of the church. It's something that needs to be dealt with. We even have a pastor on the staff of the district whose soul is mediation and reconciliation between pastors who can't get along with their congregations, different groups in the congregation who can't get along with each other. He spends a lot of time and sometimes isn't very successful at getting it done because these feelings run so strong and the hurt goes so deep. And sometimes that kind of hurt even stretches inside the realm of our own family at home. Where do we find the freeing power to forgive each other. God's forgiveness for our sins is the most freeing power in our lives. We have known fellow Christians still bothered by a sin that they simply cannot accept God's forgiveness for, that they cannot forgive themselves for. Sin has a way of doing that. It clings on to us and won't let go. John 8.34, Jesus says, He who sins is a slave to sin. Satan loves to make the guilt of our sin tie us up physically and emotionally and spiritually. And when we confess to our sins, as we did this morning, in thought, word, and deed, I don't very often get beyond just the deeds. I mean, it takes so long for me to add them all up. 
And if I go to my words and my thoughts, it's overwhelming. So that I could probably compete in vying for the title that St. Paul established of chief of sinners. And I suspect, if God is any judge, and he is, that you rank right up there too. May I be that bold? There certainly were a lot of sinners on the freeway coming over this morning. I mean, I and this one trucker were the only two obeying the speed limit. Everyone else was zooming past. And that's just one. But God says that's all it takes. If someone sins in just one sin, he is guilty of all. Now add up. Total up the sins in your life. You know what they are. Do they come to about 10,000 talents? Which probably in those days amounted to more than $12 million? Was it that kind of insurmountable number that God intended to give us to let us know there's no way we're ever going to repay that debt? No way at all. The first servant was just kidding himself to believe that given a little time, he could do that. But faced with losing our freedom, as the king ordered him and his family to be sold to repay the debt, the servant fell on his knees, begged for patience until he could pay. He was buying time, an extension of the debt. But the king did him one better. He had pity on him. And there's that Greek word again that says it came from his intestines. That's how deeply he felt for this man. It came from the bottom of his heart. He had pity on this man and canceled the debt completely. An insurmountable debt to the king is pardoned by the immeasurable mercy of God. And so God can say in Hebrews 8.14, I will remember their sins no more. Isn't that marvelous? His forgetfulness. This God who knows everything chooses to forget. Forgiven and forgotten as only God can do. I wish I had that ability. Don't you wish you had that ability? Oh, we can forgive, but what about the forgetting part? It's such a difficult thing for us. He was willing to take the debt of our sin and placed it on the body of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. And being a father, if you are one, you know how difficult that was for him to do for our sake. The first servant, by his subsequent action, showed he did not comprehend how merciful the king had been to him. Do you? I think it's important for us to appreciate the debt of sin that God has forgiven us because of Jesus Christ. How much do you trust me? Enough to close your eyes for a second? Try that. Close your eyes. It's okay. I'm not going to hurt you. Okay? Now, in, in, in your mind's eye, I want you to focus on the heavy weight of sins in your life that are pushing down on your shoulders. The burden you have been bearing day after day, year after year. I want you in your mind's eye to see the anguish that has caused you in your mind and the assault it has done on your soul. And now in your mind's eye, I want you to take that burden and transfer it over to the cross of Jesus Christ and put it on his broad shoulders and let him take away the debt of that sin, the load of that sin on you so that you can for the first time in maybe a while 
be truly free by the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. He suffered God's wrath for us on the cross. And once we accept that, then God has set us free from our sin, set us free to be able to forgive ourselves and to forgive others. There was a wonderful sign at the last church I had outside the church on a bus bench that was in front of the church. Written across the back was painted, forgiveness is the best gift you can give yourself. You see, it's not just a matter of letting God forgive you and knowing that he has truly done that, but also forgiving yourselves with that forgiveness so you know that he no longer holds that against you. The immeasurable mercy of God will always trump the insurmountable debt of our sin against the king. And when it does, we are free from punishment and slavery to sin to forgive others. The debt for the second servant was paltry by comparison. A hundred denarii. The pay for a day was about a hundred denarii a day. He could have paid that off if he's just given the opportunity, but he wasn't allowed. You see, that debt he never got a chance to repay because the first servant choked him and said, I want it now. I want it repaid. That debt sometimes is not as big as we thought. We may have blown it all out of proportion by the hurt that we feel when somebody hurts us. But if we truly understand the pardon God has given us for our sins, it will help us to shrink the hurt, shrink the hurt that's caused by our brothers and sisters in Christ. They may not even know they hurt you. Do you realize that? You may be stewing over this and they may not even know they said the word that struck a chord with you or did something that attacked you. They may not realize the sleepless nights you've gone through or the anguish of your soul as you agonized over this. But the fellowship of the church is in the business of forgiveness. Forgiveness means that one cares more about the person who has hurt us than about the hurt they have done against us. Think about that. Forgiveness is that you care more about the person who has hurt you than about the hurt they have caused you. Isn't that a description of God's forgiveness? He cares more about us than about the hurt we have caused him. On June the 17th, 2015, a 21-year-old white supremacist mercifully, mercilessly, mercilessly slaughtered nine African-American adults during a Bible study at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopalian Church in Charleston, South Carolina. We watched in awe as family members of the victims confronted the killer in church with words that struck us as out of the ordinary. They said, I forgive you. You took something very precious from me, but I still forgive you. Another said, I forgive you, and my family forgives you. But we would like to take this opportunity for you to repent and to give your life to the one who matters the most, Jesus Christ. Wow. Instead of revenge, they forgave. That's not easy. But it comes more under the purview of loving your enemies here, but the forgiveness replaced the revenge. God's forgiveness will do that. 
God's forgiveness will help you to do that as you forgive others. Dr. Scott Peck, in his book, a Road Less, the, the Road Less Travel, writes that unless we are able to at least move toward the work of forgiving the person who has hurt us, even the person who does not deserve our forgiveness, there will not be mental health. Not forgiving can take a greater toll on us than forgiving could. C.S. Lewis wrestled with a hurt in his life. He had a teacher early on, and as he went through that school, the teacher made it miserable for him, brutalized him, to the point that he almost hated him. When Lewis became a Christian, he realized that that hatred that he felt toward this man might really get in the way of his growing closer to the Lord. And so every time he tried to forgive his teacher on a daily basis, he couldn't do it at first because the bitterness was too great. But he kept saying the words every day, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. And each time he said those words, another rock in the wall he had built between him and that man fell away until one day it was totally gone. Forgiveness is not easy. It takes time for us, but it is possible. Corey Ten Boom, a saint who went through the Nazi camps, once consulted a Lutheran pastor about one that was bugging her. She said, you know, this woman that was a friend of hers suddenly hurt her out of the blue, and she had so much trouble forgiving her, and she didn't know what she was going to do because it just weighed on her mind. And the pastor turned to the church across the way and said, you see that bell up there in the tower? He said, the first impact when they ring that bell is strong. But they don't continue to ring it. It just swings by its own until gradually the sound dies away. He said, if you forgive, you will find over a period of time that the hurt will die away. The power to forgive sins comes from the enormous awareness of how much Christ has forgiven us. Forgiven us. Forgiving is not only forgiving those who hurt us, but also us as well. And you will find that if you let God forgive you, and if you forgive yourself, you will be free and free to forgive. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting.